Um, so yeah, welcome to the last talk of the afternoon session. I very much realize I stand between you and myself and the coffee break before we all are really excited before the last discussion session. And so I'm going to keep this very streamlined and I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing with Ronald Tam, Paul Duffel, and Yawen Tang at Asia A about looking and comparing the accretion in the inner cavity around protocellar binaries and thinking of how we can maybe use that to infer some source parameters when we compare to observations. And that turned out much more complicated than we thought it would be. But listening to this entire week and already the two weeks prior in the workshop, this is not at all surprising since there's a lot of physics going on. Um, it was really interesting to come back to this community since I've worked on GIMHD simulations of jetted emission from binary black holes in the supermassive context to now doing 2D viscous hydrodynamic simulations, forgetting about magnetic fields, forgetting about GR. So it's a very interesting kind of angle on a community that I already knew from a very different point of view. But um, to get right into it, like I stole that from the video recording of the Monday discussion on observations. And that's kind of what guided us a little bit along how we set up this project since there's a lot of people working in that field with simulations already. We were doing this as kind of a targeted effort and we didn't really felt like we could easily compete or, or complement what has already been doing, has already been done in the community. So really try to be guided a little bit by observations and try to look at how can we use maybe those simulations in a targeted way to actually try to think ahead of how we can compare against observations. And so one thing that we particularly wanted to do was like pick an individual binary. So this is like a young protostellar system um, and where we have clear evidence of, does this pointer actually work? It does. Um, where we have clear evidence of individual circumstellar disk, the circumbinary disk, and then try to see what we can learn from modeling parameters for a system like this, if we can even use simulations to, to do any, any meaningful comparison. And one thing that was kind of mentioned in this original paper in 2014 was that circular orbits seem to not quite exactly identify where that inner edge of the circumbinary disk should be. But of course, there's a lot of other stuff going on. But so one thing we really wanted to see is whether this location of the inner disk could be maybe better be explained by unequal masses eccentric orbits of the binary and look at how what that would indicate. The other thing that was like identified in these observations is that there's clear emission in the cavity. So there's like the potential for shocks, shock emission from compressed gas. Um, there, there's dust emission there too from like shock tracer lines. So, so all of that was something that we tried to get after with our simulations and particularly understand these kind of really complicated flow patterns in the inner cavity that we've already seen throughout this entire week, um, where there's really a lot going on. There's the circumstellar disk, there's the streamers onto the circumstellar disk, there's potential flows in between those, there's the accretion from the inner edge of the circumbinary disk. So we, we try to focus really on this inner region here and not so much on modeling the circumbinary disk in its full evolution. And basically what we did, we like, uh, this started when I was a postdoc together with Paul Duffel at Berkeley. So like, I thought like, great, we can use Disco, which, which is one of the codes that, that was very competitive here. And we, so we basically used Disco with a sync prescription. Um, there could be a lot said about this. We varied the sync prescriptions we've used. We've also varied the timescales that are used to effectively mimic um, how quickly that, that material is secreted onto the circumstellar disk and what the alpha viscosity model for that circumstellar disk would be. Um, we haven't found like a, a very strong dependence on our results on that. So that gave us some hope that that doesn't matter so much, but there's obviously something that I think overall like varies a lot of attention. We overall focus on small viscosity. So all the simulations that I've been showing you will be for like a 10 to the minus three alpha. Um, so that's, that comes with the, the benefit of potentially being more realistic, but also that we can't really run for long enough to have the entire circumbinary disk in like what we would believe would actually be meaningful dynamics. So, but it should be enough to like focus on the inner edge. So um, we run these simulations for about 10,000 orbits focusing exclusively on, on the inner dynamics and not saying much about the dynamics of the circumbinary disk in detail. Um, and yeah, we, we just set up a pretty standard uh, model with a uniform surface density, H over R 
um, resolution was really driven to like resolve the dynamics here for the circumstellar disk and the, the accretion onto that. Outer boundary was standard at like uh, 10 binary separations. And then we, we basically investigated, focused our investigation onto modeling the eccentricity. So we went from like zero to like 0.8 and then also very mild mass ratios. So that's the, the most, the strongest mass ratio we've gone to was like 0.25. In that sense, there, there wasn't, that wasn't a strong angle that we um, investigated in this. And the, the key thing that we really were after is like how much do the eccentric orbits change the dynamics inside the inner cavity? And is that something that we could potentially can observe? And so basically this is a nice overview of the actual evolution during one orbit. So like from left to right, you're seeing the evolution during one orbit. The top is just a non-eccentric circular equal mass binary. Um, the second row is um, the same binary, but with an eccentricity of 0.6. The bottom, we've also added a mass ratio of 0.4. And one thing we found is that we, we do see this kind of pattern of like what we in, dubbed like a figure eight pattern of this flow pattern for the, the accretion onto the individual circumstellar disks and like the, the cavity that is being opened up that seemed to be relatively robust as long as we incre um, included significant eccentricity. So in, for, for what we've done, this was ex eccentricity above 0.4 and then mass ratios, at least the ones we considered didn't seem to change that picture dramatically. Um, and, and this is basically zooming in on just one of those. Obviously there's like quite a lot of temporal variation between uh, with, which phase of the orbit you're in. But then for the most part, if you think about where that binary spends most of its, most of its time, like you would see some relatively indicative figure uh, pattern, figure eight pattern for, for this flow inside the inner cavity. Um, and so then the question we went to afterwards was really, how can we quantify this besides just looking at that? How we, can we quantify what's going on in the cavity? And one thing we were interested in was the size of the cavity and how much gas there is in the cavity as a function of eccentricity. So what you see here on the left is basically just the, the normalized surface density as a function of um, radius for the different eccentricities that we considered. So this is just the um, equal mass case. And then also you see basically, you see the time averaged profile between 2000 and 5000 orbits of the of the simulations that we've run and you also see in this shaded region which i'm not quite sure how visible that is on the screen but you can see basically the variation that is actually part part of the temporal variation of these profiles and what you really see is that a the inner edge of the disk for higher eccentricities is not so well defined there isn't like a sharp kind of feature where you can easily pinpoint and say like this is where the inner edge of my disk is um, at the same time, for higher eccentricities, there seems to be overall more gas left in the cavity. So it's not as deep as a, as a cavity um, as for the, for the um, circular case. And of course, like this is just, this, this is just averaged um, to, to get a spherical profile. This looks much more complicated if you're actually trying to compare that in time to, um, to what we're observing in, in those systems. Um, so that makes it complicated. And then one thing we thought we could maybe use would be um, the area of the cavity as this radius is not really that well defined. So we looked at like, what is the area of the cavity? And for that, we basically just determined a, a cutoff um, of like how low the surface density drops below the, the um, central surface density and determined that anything that would be like below 2.5% of, of that um, maximum surface density would be part of the cavity. And for that, we do find that there is a relatively strong dependence as long as we get to an eccentricity above 0.6 where the area of the cavity and that correlates with that outer or that inner edge of the circumbinary disk being kind of smeared out and further out overall, we, we did find that there's like a, um, that that could be used as a tracer for, for what is going on with the eccentricity of the source. Um, but of course that's like complicated to compare since like, how do you actually measure the area of the cavity from observations, which often you don't have like a full orbital evolution or like the time scales are too long. So, so that, that is something that could be used, but it's complicated. So that wasn't like 
as enlightening either. Um, one thing we then looked at is basically, okay, what can we say about potential shock emission? And here we really just like did a very simple model where we looked at, this is just the same surface density evolution for like two of the binaries, the circular case and the eccentric case, and then looked at the potential vorticity in the bottom row, which really tells you like how compressed material um, can potentially get. So this could be an interesting thing that could lead to shocks. We obviously don't have the, the physics in here to truly talk about shocks that are forming. Um, but this is something where, you know, everything in, in yellow here basically indicates material where there could be shocks. And you see there's actually a lot going on inside the inner cavity. There's also stuff going on at the edge of those streamers coming in. But at the same time, you also see that in the circular orbit case. So then the question is, is that actually a faceful tracer if you wanted to say something about the, the source parameters? Um, but that at least highlights that we could use something like that and look at the shock emission and um, figure out if there is um, something we can say about the, the, the source parameters. So, so that, that, is, that is nice. And what we're currently doing, and that's mainly been hampered by the pandemic and me moving to Amsterdam and building up a new research group uh, and us not like getting our act together quickly enough. But so what we're doing right now is actually doing radiative transfer modeling on top of those hydro simulations and then building that into the already existing synthetic or mock observation pipelines that exist, for example, for modeling what the images like this would look in armor. And this is where it also then got really quickly, really complicated since, and I think this like final few minutes of my talk will really set the stage for the discussion in the afternoon, which will be on mock observations. But how do we even decide which, which part of the orbit we compare to observations? Time averaging doesn't maybe make so much sense, especially if you're looking at a very eccentric source. But then also, how do you pick which part of the orbit the binary might be in. If you don't have enough observational data on that source, or if the orbital time scale is too long, we can't really easily infer where the source is. So do we just pick random data, uh, like pick particular parts of the orbit? Do we average in time to get some of the variability out? And, and these are kind of the questions we're dealing with right now. And I think that overall, like just having listen to the, the week of um, talks here and also the, the discussions that are already coming up during the workshop. I think these are all highly interesting topics in terms of making progress as a community. And then the other question really is like, oh, are microphysics in those simulations even good enough to do any of this comparison? And I think if I were to honestly answer that, it would be a no right now. But then also we've discussed quite a bit on like how to improve that. And there isn't like an immediate clear answer, but I think that is a really interesting question of like, how good are those 2D simulations, viscous hydrodynamics? Can we use them to compare, the, compare against data? I mean, this is these are in some sense, the most comprehensive suite of parameter simulations that we have right now. And they will allow us to do this comparison, but is it meaningful to do it? I would argue it is because we can still learn about how, to, how do we do this temporal distinction in the orbit. And I think th these are lessons that are gonna be useful, but I think that's something where it's gonna be really interesting to discuss in a little bit of more of a broader context in the, in the afternoon discussion after the coffee break. Um, and then, yeah, what was exciting is that the, the, obviously this result was mentioned a couple of times, like, um, indicating the flow pattern um, in, in the science paper around a binary protostar where it looked relatively similar to what we had been kind of seeing in the simulations and our kind of standard features of, of these um, flow patterns inside these cavities, but th that could be a tracer, for example, for eccentricity or a specific mass ratio. And I think that was something where at least we're getting there with observations so we can do this comparison meaningfully and we can actually learn where as, simula as simulators, we need to really improve our modeling where we maybe need to focus what we want to model so that we can make maximum use of these like amazing observations that really resolve what is going on inside these cavities. Um, so let me summarize, and I think I kept that pretty streamlined at 15 minutes, which I like. Um, we see more gas in the cavity for higher eccentricities. There's not so much dependence on the mass ratio of the system. And there was also clear indication that it might be quite likely that we have shock material in the inner cavity around the circumstellar disks, but also around the streamers and that that all is like exciting for, exciting for us to include more physics and modeling those systems so that we can actually do a more meaningful um, comparison to observations. 
but then also that that comparison is going to be quite complicated since how do we determine how can we use these flow patterns to constrain parameters of the source how can we integrate this with all the other observations that you showed you in that first slide where everything else we can learn about binaries, um, velocity information, all of that, and how can we make maximum use of the simulation cap capabilities that we have so that we can invest both the person time in terms of developing those codes and adding more physics to them, but also the computational resources that we have available to really maximize the science return from those observations. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and uh, I'll take any questions. Excellent. Thanks, Philip. So, do we have any questions? Steve. Do you have an intuitive picture of what these figure eight patterns are doing, how they arise? Not exactly. So we tried to, to get to actually understanding physically a little bit of where they come from. Um, since they seem to be relatively robust in the simulations we looked at, um, but haven't really haven't really found a good way of describing them yet. And that was partially because I didn't have so much time to work on it while, while kind of keeping other lines of research alive. But that's something that we're, we're also specifically trying to look at now in terms of physically, where do those come from? But yeah, unfortunately for now, it's, I don't quite know. Just uh, thank you, it's an interesting talk. Just for the first statement, the main conclusion of the talk, I just want to make sure I got the point. The, you don't mean that for given mass supply from large distance, right? If you change the eccentricity of the binary, you get more mass. You don't mean that because you don't resolve, you, you cannot run, you don't run that long time. It, that is very correct, yes. Okay. So okay. this is in the, in the limit. You mean, I guess well, in that means you put in by hand some torus around the binary, same torus, but two experiments, one with little eccentricity, one with large eccentricity, you find the, the latter had higher. Is that what you mean? That, that's Wait, what you can mean. you repeat that last part of? So I just want this statement come from basically assuming that you, at t equals zero, you're putting a torus yes. around the binary, same torus, right? Then you run two experiments, one with zero eccentricity, another with finite eccentricity. You find the latter. The latter, the second case, gave you higher mass after. That's correct. Assuming you reach some kind of quasi steady state, or the quasi steady state. That, that is very correct. There's, it's not that it's like a self-consistent modeling in terms of the entire process of like how you would feed that binary, yes. Is that answering your question? Well, I guess the question is 1500, 1500 uh, orbit is very impressive. That, that's enough like, given your very low viscosity, right? Is that enough? You think it's enough? Right, and so we've run this for like 10,000 orbits. 10, but like, so basically what we looked at, like what would be the time scale for having the inner cat, like really just the inner edge at like i equals one a, well, like, sorry, at the inner edge of that binary, like where, sorry, inner edge of the circumbinary disk, do we have, have we run long enough to resolve basically what is happening there? And that, I think that for 10,000 orbits for the viscosity we have is true. But what we can say is like how the outer parts of the circumbinary disk evolve and like interact with feeding basically that accretion. So that, that, that is very true that we can't answer that question. It's very much in the limited scale of just looking at those innermost dynamics. Hi, uh, Ian Shikala, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I had a thought on your uh, beam processing uh, prompt. As an observer, it would be really awesome to make a movie of um, your simulation, not just choosing, you know, a few snapshots of, of phase, but to frame dump everything, run that through CASA SimObserve, and then make a movie of that. And not only that, do it from many different inclination viewing angles. Because the challenge I find with looking at simulation papers is, you know, we're not viewing disks face on most of the time yeah. and we don't know yeah how to match up orbital phase but when you sort of see that whole ensemble represented um that is so much more information to sort of compare piece to piece and i know casa is not the most efficient <laughs> software in the world but you know if you're already running a uh you know hydro sim it's probably you know 
pretty in, inconsequential to, to do that large suite of processing, although I don't know for sure. Yeah, I think it should at least be comparable in, in terms of, I mean, I'm not running the, the CASA myself, but like, I mean, that, that I think it, it's still a significant computational expense compared to like the 2D hydro simulations. Obviously, if you were to go to 3D or MHD, that's completely different. But I think your, your point is very well taken. I think, I think that's something that to just establish what we're even looking at, I think is something that we have to do since otherwise it, it could always just be a selection effect of like which times during the orbit you chose, which inclination angle. Right, like the, the visualization would need a cluster to do that, right. but it's probably not, you know, on the yeah, scale. Yeah, it's of the definitely doable. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So this this reminded me of what the Event Horizon Telescope team does. So they 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 have a bank of simulations, then they re retrace them, and that creates uh, you know uh, several snapshots, not several, you know, thousands of snapshots per simulation. And so then they then they then they fit the images to you know they do some statistics on what, which images fit the observations best and. They do the blurring and also the time averaging based on the cadences. And so I imagine, is anyone doing this like with ALMA data for planetary and stellar systems kind of thing? I don't know. So uh, I, I guess are they are they doing similar like work to the event? Horizon Telescope team in that they, they 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 do a simulated observation at all inclination angles for each simulation, and then they they do they kind of get a a probabilistic sense of what best fits the observations. Um, I mean, from from what I've seen, people do some papers try different inclination viewing angles and stuff. But I you know taking this opportunity, like Phil prompted, um, you know I think why not just go the whole way right i mean you have the the cluster there it's it's you know you're already using up all the time to do this the sim why not take it the whole way and, and i think it would be a really useful product um for the community to just and there's a whole opportunity to make it into like a full interactive you know fan the whole thing with the the way uh the visualization software is now but even just a, a few different inclinations covering the full orbital period. I think that's that's kind of the key thing is, is you know zooming around and matching it up to whatever your observation shows, which is a snapshot of some random you know set of parameters. So I, 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 I'm a great fan of movies. I love movies. Okay, so and and I agree. You know, yeah, no, yours, is a, yours are an example of that. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to 2012. Yeah. 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 But so, uh, and I agree, you know, the great thing about movies is you can sort of pick the snapshot yourself as, as one that looks most like your object. But, uh, you know, and, and some of us have done synthetic observations of these simulations when we're trying to um, compare to particular ob objects such as GWORI, for example, we did some ALMA simulations of what that would look like and so on. Um, the, the the issue here though is <laughs> is the parameter space is huge right and and plus you've also got the fact I mean these particular simulations are of course two dimensional so you can't generate synthetic observations essentially from two dimensional things because you don't have the third dimension so it's maybe face on perhaps but as soon as you go to inclination it's the height of the the disk that matters and then you've got a whole lot of other effects such as you know your disk um, sorry, your dust grain size is a function of Z. And so then it just gets, you know, so I think unless you're modeling particular objects, um, the parameter space to do something general, a huge catalog would just be absolutely enormous. Yeah, right. Now, this, this, that's a huge problem is and, and where a specific object can help. But um I'm just trying to think of, you know, my limitations and in, in fully trying to understand outputs from, say, uh, you know, simulations that are more general. Um, and that, you know, for my background could, could be very helpful and possibly for other observers. I just want to point that Ian's 
request is very modest compared to mine the other day that the observer should make a movie. <laughs> so we both have to make movies. I think that's a perfect time to transition into coffee and then start this discussion up uh, in 30 minutes or so. So thanks a lot. 20 minutes.